Okay, so let's go on to chapter 24, which is comfort, rest, and sleep. Okay, so comfort, rest, and sleep are needed for well-being, and if anything affects, um, can affect comfort, rest, and sleep, it would be something, a disease process, restlessness, confusion, um, and, um, oh, pain. So the total person is affected by comfort, rest, and sleep. So if you have something that's interrupting that comfort, rest, and sleep, basically the person is not going to feel well rested and their quality of life will be overall impacted. So discomfort and pain can be physical or emotional and rest and sleep, actually their, the purpose of it is to restore energy and well-being. And of course, illness and injury will increase the need for rest and sleep because our body needs time to repair. So comfort is a state of well-being and the person doesn't have any physical or emotional pain, so they're at calm and they're at peace. So OBRA and CMS have uh, required that uh, we give care that promotes well-being, so therefore comfort, rest, and sleep are needed and then rooms are designed and equipped for comfort. And um, so we try to, uh, and when I say uh, uh, rooms are designed and equipped for comfort, I'm looking, we're looking at like the temperature of the room, ventilation, the noise, the odors, and the lighting, because this is all controlled to meet that person's needs. So, over requires that we promote comfort, and I'm ahead of myself here. Um, so no more than four persons can be to a room, okay? Um, most of the time you're, nowadays you either find single rooms or, um, or um, semi-private, like two, but I have worked in an older facility. The building is really quite old and they do have sometimes three to a room. So, but there, can all, there can't be more than four. So a suspended curtain that goes around the bed for privacy because the person, remember, has to be able to be fully enclosed for privacy. And then a bed of proper height and size for the person, a clean, comfortable mattress, linens, of course, that suit weather and climate, uh, clean and orderly room, odor-free. Remember, the room temperature is between 71 and 81. An acceptable noise level with adequate ventilation humid, and room humidity and appropriate lighting. So pain, pain affects sleep, okay? Um, and pain or discomfort, they're synonymous, uh, means to ache or hurt or be sore. So this is a subjective value from the person, but you have to rely on what the person says. They know what their pain is and how bad it is. So what they say pain is, that's what it is. So if the person complains of pain or discomfort, um, the person has pain or discomfort, even if they don't look like they have pain or discomfort. And a lot of times people who have chronic pain have learned to live with pain. And in that case, we try to, um, as a healthcare team, we try to control pain so that it's tolerable for them so they can go about and do what they need to do. And it doesn't mean that the pain goes away because it doesn't, but they're participate in the activities they want to participate in. And of course, pain differs for each person. Some have a very tolerance of pain versus someone who has a very low tolerance of pain. Uh, and, you know, we fall all over that continuum. So it's very individualized. And pain is always a warning from the body. So you can't, so just remember, you can't see, hear, touch, or smell pain. So you have to rely on what the person says it is, even if it doesn't look like they're in pain. Now, another thing about pain is remember it can be acute or it can be chronic. Now acute pain is usually short-lived and it goes, but it's usually from injury or some form of trauma and it usually goes away with a little time. Chronic pain lasts 
And that's what you usually deal with in the long-term care facility are those who are dealing with chronic pain. Doesn't mean they can't have acute pain, but for the most part, a lot of times you deal with people who have chronic pain. Well, we don't show, when we have acute pain, our vital signs will go up, okay? Our blood pressure goes up, our heart rate goes up, our, our respiratory um, rate can go up. But in chronic pain, our body can't continue that forever. So what it does is it acclimates to the pain. So then the blood pressure comes down, the pulse rate comes down, and the respiratory rate comes back down to where it's normally at. So if you're looking for vital signs only as a measure of pain, it won't work. It doesn't work that way. So you always need to report complaints of pain to the nurse um, so that she can use that in the nursing process as far as care planning for the person. Um, pain usually signals tish, will signal tissue damage and it often causes the person to seek health care. So I've talked to you a little bit about two types of pain. The acute pain, which is felt suddenly from an injury or disease or trauma or surgery, and it usually lasts less than six months. Chronic pain, on the other hand, lasts longer than that. It can be the rest of their, their life, um, but there's no longer any tissue damage. Radiating pain is another type of pain, and it's felt at the site of tissue damage and in nearby areas. And then phantom pain is felt in the body part that's no longer there. So maybe they had a lot of pain in their leg. Eventually that leg had to be amputated, but then they feel phantom pain. Sorry for the puppy. He's barking. So factors that affect pain, many factors affect pain. Your past experiences with pain, um, it can also cause anxiety. Anxiety increases how much pain the person feels, so that's just a whole vicious cycle in itself. For the more anxiety you have, the more pain you'll experience, vice versa. The more pain you have, the more anxiety. Rest and sleep affect pain. Um, attention, the more person thinks about the pain, the worse it seems. And then personal and family duties affect pain responses. Um, let's see. All right. Mm -hmm. So, depending on all these factors, really is how we try to care plan for the for the pain because you don't want a person's anxiety level anxiety levels to be super high because their pain is just going to increase. And if they've had bad experiences with pain control in the past, then they anticipate pain to be worse than it is. So pain is a big thing and um, oftentimes uh, pain will be ignored uh, when they're are chill, like when they were younger and children or they're tending to children. Uh, and some people go to work with pain and others deny pain if a sudden illness is feared. You know, that's another confirmation that they have something serious. They don't want that. They're in kind of a denial and they're, and they're fearful. Um, but, you know, illness uh, can interfere with a job or going to school or caring for children, a partner, or ill parents. So, I mean, pain is a big deal. And let's move on from there. So factors that affect pain. The value or the meaning of the pain, like we've discussed before, support from others, you know, culture is another way, uh, illness, age of the person, and persons with dementia really can't, may not be able to tell you they're in pain or about their pain. You know, you, you can, they'll say I'm hurting, but then when you ask them where are, they, where are you hurting, they they don't know how to explain that to you uh, or they might it might not even tell you about pain but maybe they're rubbing an arm or rubbing that area that hurts or maybe they have a look about their face that's not right um, these are all nonverbal ways to tell you they're in pain or maybe they can't sleep through the night and they wake up in pain but they can't tell you so most of the time we try to anticipate that these uh, small behavior changes, especially if they're occurring at night, the first thing we think about is that they're, gonna, they're in pain, but they can't tell us we're in pain. So any of those nonverbal cues that a person might give you, whether it's a, whether or unusual behaviors, 
you want to report that to the nurse so she can assess to see if they're in pain. And if they are, we try to give them something. Usually it's a mild uh, pain reliever like Tylenol to see if that will assist them and so they can go back to sleep or, or at least go back to the activity, whatever that activity is they were doing. So the nurse will, is going to do a pain assessment after you report um, the person's pain. And she's going to ask them about the location, if there's any radiation, onset duration, intensity. So you might hear the nurse ask all these questions. A lot of times you will hear them ask them to rate their pain um, from 1 to 10. Zero is no pain. So it's, you know, if you've already complained of pain, why would you say rate it from 0 to 10? 10 because zero is no pain. But 10 is like excruciating pain. So the rate kind of goes like this. One, two, three is a mild pain. Four, five, six is a moderate pain. Seven, eight, nine is severe pain. And 10 is excruciating pain. Pain beyond what they've ever experienced before. And then she wants them to describe the pain if that's possible. A lot of times my elderly patients, uh, they'll say, well, I just hurt. They don't describe it very well. And then anything that caused the pain, that's known as precipitating factor you doing before that caused the pain, if they know, or anything that affects the pain, what makes it better, what makes it worse. And then, of course, we get their vital signs and then any other signs and symptoms that they might display. That's the pain assessment. Now, you're not responsible for doing an assessment. You're never responsible for doing an assessment. That's the nurse. But you are responsible for reporting uh, your observations and recording them. So nursing measures that promote comfort, um, again, it should be on the care plan. But there's some things that are just common sense that promote comfort and relieve pain. Uh, one of the things we can do is called distraction. And that means to change the person's center of attention. So instead of them concentrating on their pain, we're going to distract them either with conversation, maybe reminiscing, or maybe even watching the television, listening to the radio, or some type of soothing music that they like. Uh, we also try to do what's called relaxation, which which means to be from, uh, free from mental and physical stress. So, you know, this is be like deep breathing exercises, yoga, um, what's some of those other things, but some things like that, anything that would help to relax the mind, relax the body. And then there's something called guided imagery. And this is creating or focusing on an image. So this would be an we're we're discussing pain, but I'm going to give you an example. Like if you feel really, really, really hot, you're hot, okay. Your guided imagery would be you would close your eyes and you would focus on being uh, on Mount Everest where it's really, really cold and the wind is blowing. It's very shivery. You're shivering, in fact, it's so cold and that wind is hitting your face and you're breathing in that cold air. That's guided imagery because you're creating an opposite effect here um, so that you would hopefully feel cooler. And it can work. It works. Um, but, you know, it doesn't, it's not instantaneous. You know, you close your eyes. Oh, yeah. Oh, I feel better. You know, a guided imagery takes time, just like relaxation techniques take a little time. So, and then there's the drugs. We can give them drugs to control or relieve the pain. And sometimes it's just a simple uh, measure of repositioning them. You know, common sense stuff, you know, uh, making sure their body is in alignment. You know, sometimes it's simply that. They're not comfortable the way they're laying. So there are some things that we can do that doesn't require a doctor's order, doesn't require um, um, any special thing to do. It's just kind of common sense stuff. So again, we want to um, promote comfort and we will care plan for any type of safety measures, you know, because basically we want to protect them from injury falls and fractures, um, you know, and, uh, we would do that because a lot of times we do have to do that because we're going to give them a drug that's going to kind of make them drowsy or it might cause them dizziness or coordination problems. So again, you know, drugs will do that. So um, we would then have to, sometimes what you give them 
creates new problems. So you have to keep um, care planning for that. Dig on it, what's wrong here? Okay, I'm gonna come on and work. Okay, all right, so other therapy measures, uh, we can use TENS unit, which is called a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Um, you can get these over the counter. This does not require a doctor's order if you wanted to use it yourself. But um, if you've ever been to a chiropractor and after he have adjusted your back, they send you back for a little therapy. And they put these little electrodes on you and you feel that little bzzz and, um, and it stimulates the muscle, but it's not continuous. It comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. Uh, we can also use ice and heat applications and ultrasound therapy transmits sound waves so that can be used and then exercise and massage therapy. These are all methods to use to help assist the person uh, in controlling uh, pain or at least make um, block those pain signals so it will be more tolerable. Now, promoting rest is the next slide. Uh, in promoting rest, again, we're meeting physical needs. So first you want to think, are they thirsty? Are they hungry? Do they need to go to the bathroom? Then assist them to a comfortable position, good alignment. Uh, you need to provide a quiet setting. You might, uh, you know, pull the curtain so that they don't have excess light coming in from the hall. Uh, or turn on a soft light in the room so that they do have some light but not big bright lights. Um, a quiet setting, of course, the noise level being a little down. Um, providing a clean, dry, wrinkle-free bed. Clean, dry, wrinkle-free bed. And then providing a clean, neat, uncluttered room. So in case they do get up, you know, you don't want to prevent uh, have things there for them to fall over. So un a clean, neat, uncluttered room. All right. Um, so rest, just remember rest needs to be calm, at ease, relaxed, you know, decreased anxiety, decreased stress, or none at all. That would be even the best. And, um, and rest can involve inactivity or the person just does things that are calming and relaxing. That would promote rest too. So like if they like to knit and that's relaxing to them, then you let them knit. Um, and then promoting comfort also meets their safety and security needs. So, you know, again, you always have to keep that call light within reach. It's a critical criteria, ladies. Always keep it within reach. Explain the reasons for care. Explain how care is given. Um, and follow the person's routines and rituals whenever possible. Um, promoting Comfort, promoting comfort also promotes love and belonging needs uh, by visits or calls from families and friends or reading cards and letters. You never read a card and letter incidentally unless they give you permission to. Uh, and sometimes a lot of people do have vision problems and don't mind you to read the card. They enjoy that, but you always have to ask for permission. Then promoting self-esteem needs, um, you know, allowing them personal choice in their sleepwear, um, assisting them with their hygiene and grooming as needed. That's all part of promoting self-esteem. Uh, and we do try to plan and organize care to allow uninter uninterrupted rest. That's important because sometimes we do, we don't do it intentionally and it is more interrupted in acute care settings, the rest, because they're, they go to sleep and maybe we have to get a set of vital signs in the acute care setting. So we're actually waking them up to do it. So in the long-term care facility, we can control that even better. So, you know, basically that uninterrupted um, time of sleep and rest is really critical. Um, so sleep's this basic need. It lets the mind and the body rest. It saves energy. Um, it slows the body's functions down. Um, vital signs are lower uh, than when awake, as they should be. Tissue healing and repair occur at this time, or at the best, th at this time 
is the best time. And sleep lowers stress, tension, and anxiety. And it also, you know, just refreshes and renews the person, especially if they feel rested. You know, that's the big thing. Sometimes I get people who sleep maybe a smaller amount of hours than I think they should have. But if they feel this is the key point. Do you feel rested? So when I do an assessment, I'm always asking them that. And people look the parts too. You know, you know when somebody looks rested and you, then you know someone who doesn't look rested. The circadian rhythm, I just want you to briefly know about the circadian rhythm. It's a daily rhythm based on a 24-hour cycle. And it has to do with our sleep-wake cycle. And um, the thing here is that healthcare often interferes with the person's circadian rhythm and the sleep wake cycle. And there are two phases of sleep a person goes through. They go through the non REM sleep. And that's when this is the phase of sleep when there's no rapid eye movement. And then there's the rapid eye movement sleep or the REM sleep. Okay. And the REM is when we usually dream. So um, the circadian rhythm. That's really all I want you to know, right? It, it can be interfered with by our routines. Sure. Um, and in non-random, you can read in your book about non-rim and rim sleep. I'm not going to ask you a test question per se about the stages of sleep. You can learn that when you go to um, when you get into nursing school. But basically. Um, I do want you to remember about, remember those abbreviations and keywords because enuresis, which is urinary incontinence in bed at night, can occur during REM sleep. So um, and when, that's why we check on them every two hours, especially with our incontinent people. We're putting our, you know, gloved hands down there, feeling for wetness on that chuck. So you don't have to necessarily wake somebody up to know if they're wet or not. But if they're wet, then we are going to be waking them up because we're going to have to turn them over and change that out and give them pericare. Got sidetracked there, but that's what happens. So sleep factors. Sleep needs vary with each age group, and I think it's a little bit individual as well. So the amount of need, the amount needed decreases with age. I always seem to think when I look at the older persons that they seem to sleep more than when we did during the day or when I when they're working years which um, they may but it's really kind of broken up sleep it's not like you work all day you come home you do your stuff and then you go and you sleep for this long period of time whatever that happens to be for you um, there they may not be as sleep as Monday night but then they catch up during the day so it can be a little deceiving. But factors that actually affect sleep are all listed here. Their illness, their nutrition, exercise, their environment, drugs they take or some other sub or, and other substances, their lifestyle changes, and emotional problems or sleep disorders. Those can all affect. Um, insomnia is one of the disorders that you will hear about and that you do see sometimes. It's a chronic condition which the person can't sleep or stay asleep at night. So if a person's having a, a, a part, of the, part of the problems that we assess for as a nurse, which you do not have to do, but we will ask them, can you fall? Do you have trouble falling asleep or you have trouble staying asleep? And sometimes they can't, they have both. They can't, they have difficulty falling asleep and they have difficulty staying asleep. So there's three forms here. They can't fall asleep, they can't stay asleep, or they waken early and can't fall back asleep again. With sleep deprivation, this is a whole new beast. Um, this is the amount of amount and quality of sleep are basically decreased. And with sleep deprivation, there's uh, we looked for a physical pro problem first, and then or and or a mental problem, and then we try. It's an underlying cause here with sleep deprivation. But man, they can really get confused and be way out there in left field if they don't get their sleep, if they're sleep deprived, just as you would be if you were sleep deprived. Uh, sleepwalking, um, I haven't seen too much of this, I'm not saying that it doesn't occur, and I'm sure that it does, but uh, I 
didn't experience this very much uh, with my um, elderly persons, but basically sleepwalking is the person will leave the bed and walk about. They're not aware of their sleepwalking and it might last three or four minutes or it can be longer. But basically when a person sleepwalk, you don't try to wake them up, but you just protect them from injury and falling and then just guide them back to bed. And if you uh, must waken them, you waken them gently, you know, quietly, calmly call their name, that type of thing. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. So basically stress, fatigue, and some drugs are common causes of sleepwalking. And again, just guide them back to bed. Um, and that, that usually takes care of it if they are sleepwalking. And basically we're just preventing injury here. All right, sleep apnea is another little problem that we do run into quite a bit. So when a person has sleep apnea, they basically stop breathing for short periods of time throughout the night. And what happens is when they stop breathing, our carbon dioxide levels increase because we're not getting any oxygen and we're not getting any oxygen in so they our oxygen levels decrease and so the body wakes you up hey we need to breathe here and so they their sleep is constantly interrupted because of the apnea and there's lots of different causes for sleep apnea too many to go into but basically um, the person doesn't know they have it or um, and sometimes uh, their partner knows it though they might really snore loudly or then they jump uh you know they jump or jerk awake uh, because the body's telling them hey wake up um so they and they as the person who is having the sleep apnea they might report being sleepy and tired during the day one way that we do treat it is through a CPAP machine and a CPAP machine stands for continuous positive airway pressure and that's that little nose thing that sits over, uh, it's a little it's kind of a reduced mask but it sits over the nose and pumps air into their little face and that keeps the airway open so that you know uh, they can get their oxygen and then they can sleep it works pretty good so promoting sleep, again, the nurse will assess the person's sleep patterns. Measures are planned to promote sleep. Follow the care plan. Report your observations about how the person slept. And the person is, of course, is always involved in planning their care. Now, I can do a care plan without involving the resident. But I'll tell you what, they're not going to really follow it. It's always best to include them because if you don't include them and you make up this some this nurse has made up this beautiful goal, but it's not something the, pe the resident wants to do, <laughs> you're never going to reach it. And the whole point here is to create um, and maintain their quality of life. So, you know, they, the person needs to be involved in their planning, care, planning of care. With a person with Alzheimer's disease or some other form of dementia, um, they can wander at night. That's not uncommon. And they they can also get restless and confused often uh, with when night approaches. And basically this is, we call it sundowner syndrome. Uh, but what happens here is even though they may not be able to tell you their light helps you to focus on your environment. Okay. They can see the environment when night comes, they no longer have that. So they're wandering. It, it makes, it's like being um, on the sea. You know, when I go, when you, if you go boating or, or some form of that, and you see land, it's kind of your boundary. But if you were out in open sea, it's nothing but water, nothing. So to them, that's, it's kind of like that. They just get, they get more confused. They've lost their environmental cues, and so they wander more. And they get really restless, anxious, and their behaviors can come alive at that time too, as well. So basically, you know, comfort, rest, sleep are all needed for quality of life and well-being. Try to pr promote that. Uh, we try to promote personal choice, and and, um, and the resident has, a, you know, and assess pain and manage that as as much as possible, so they can again have a quality of life. 
So that ends this particular um, chapter and I will talk to you soon.